my artificial sweeteners. What's up guys? Welcome back for another educational video on the channel that smacks down bro science harder than Will Smith. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment for the algorithm and make sure your notifications are turned on so that you know when we pump out a new video. I apologize for the Will Smith joke. I know there's about a billion of them, but there's one more. So this week, uh, we're gonna discuss a study that's been getting a lot of press recently. And this is the study from the Nutrinet Santee population. This is a French study where they had a cohort of about 100,000 people and tracked them over about eight years and looked at various dietary metrics to see how associated they were with the incidence of cancer. Now the study that's come out recently from this data set is a study demonstrating an association between artificial sweeteners and cancer. Oh no! So was I wrong? Are artificial sweeteners gonna give you cancer? Let's break it down. The first thing to keep in mind is that this is a correlation study. We cannot infer causality from correlation. For example, there is nearly a perfect correlation, over 99% between the spending on science, space, and technology and the suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. That is nearly a perfect correlation, but do we really think that those two variables have anything to do with each other? That's just one example of correlation not necessarily being causation. That's not to say that epidemiology can just be completely tossed out, but it's important to understand that we really can't infer causality from this kind of data. So what did they find? They found that there was an association between all cancers and the total amount of artificial sweeteners consumed. Sounds scary, right? When we look at the hazard ratios, there's some interesting things to point out here that don't necessarily support the idea overall that artificial sweeteners are causing cancer. So first of all, sucralose consumption specifically had no association with any cancer at all. Second of all, when we look at the hazard ratios, which is basically a hazard ratio of one means there's no difference, that there's equal risk. So if you have a hazard ratio of say 1.2, that's a relative risk increase of 20%. So if you have a hazard ratio of 0.8, it's a decrease in risk of about 20%, relative decrease. They categorize the people consuming artificial sweeteners into non-consumers, low consumers, and high consumers. We should really expect to see kind of a linear progressive increase in the hazard ratios if artificial sweeteners are indeed causing cancer, but we don't necessarily see that. So for example, if we look at the hazard ratios between lower consumers and higher consumers, for total artificial sweeteners, the higher consumers actually have a lower hazard ratio than the lower consumers. That seems a little bit weird. Now, I'm not sure if it was statistically significant. Both the lower and higher consumers had higher incidence of cancer compared to the non-consumers, but still, you would expect to see the lower consumers have a lower hazard ratio than the higher consumers. This also held true for asulfame K and aspartame the hazard ratios were slightly higher in the lower consumers compared to the higher consumers. Which again, to me, that just doesn't quite make sense when you consider if artificial sweeteners truly are causing cancer, you would expect to see the highest hazard ratios in the higher consumers. And that suggests that there's possibly other factors that are influencing this. Just to give you an idea of the other factors, compared to non-consumers, higher consumers tended to be more often women, younger, smokers, less physically active, more educated, and more likely to have diabetes. They also had lower intakes of fiber, although it wasn't really much lower, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, higher intakes of sodium, total sugar, and sugary foods and drinks. There's confounding variables. Now they did attempt to adjust for some of these variables, but you cannot adjust for every single variable in these sorts of things. It's just not something that's possible. Now what I thought was interesting is they kind of left out the part that sucralose wasn't associated with any cancers at any point. They just highlighted the fact that especially aspartame and asulfame K were associated with cancer. To me, that seems like there might be some bias there in terms of what they were 
hoping to find because if all data is the same and you trust your data, the story from this might be Sucralose appears to be completely safe, but instead they kind of said, well, there was less data points for Sucralose. So they kind of said to exercise caution about Sucralose since there was less data points, but there was still thousands of data points. In their fully adjusted models where they did account for some of these confounding variables, some of the statistical significance went away. So for example, for the association between breast cancer and the total incidence of artificial sweeteners was no longer statistically significant when they used the fully adjusted model. And the same thing goes for asulfame K. It was no longer statistically significant, although it was trending towards significance, uh, when they did the fully adjusted model. Prostate cancer, there was actually no association of any of the artificial sweeteners with prostate cancer. So I also wanna point out how careful we've got to be when interpreting this kind of data. You guys have seen me talk about cohort studies and cross-sectional studies and correlation data in general and how important it is to be cautious. So for example, the hazard ratios in this study were about 1.15 to 1.2. Uh, mostly across the board, except in the case of sucralose, which was not associated with cancer. So just to give you guys an idea how confounding these things are, there is a study out there that showed that the reported behavior of eating anything at any time increased the risk of colon cancer in women. If you eat anything at any time, you have an increased risk of colon cancer. And the hazard ratio was greater than 1.2. So basically greater than what they found in this study. So I'm not ready to use this as conclusive evidence that artificial sweeteners cause cancer. There's just not good evidence that they do, especially when we consider all the confounding variables. What we really need are longer term human randomized control trials. And in the human randomized control trials we do have, what we see is if anything, artificial sweeteners seem to help with weight loss a little bit. They don't seem to affect insulin or glycemia and any available health marker we have to assess health doesn't seem to change or improves when we're substituting in artificial sweeteners compared to what people were doing previously. Which makes sense because if people are replacing normal sugar intake with artificial sweeteners, it should be a net benefit. And that is what we see in the research literature. And again, the hazard ratios with sugar intake and cancer are about 1.2 to 1.5. So significantly higher. One more thing to keep in mind, even if artificial sweeteners do increase the risk of cancer. And I'm not ready to make that claim yet. It is a relatively small increase in the risk. 13% sounds like a lot or 15% sounds like a lot, but this is a relative risk. Many of you may remember a study came out showing that meat intake increases the risk of cancer by 18% which is about the same or greater than what we're seeing in this study. Many of the people who are anti-artificial sweeteners are actually like low carb pro meat. So please let me know how that cognitive dissonance works. But keep in mind, a relative risk increase is not the same as an absolute increase in risk. So what we mean by relative risk is that, for example, if you have normally a 4% risk of cancer, a relative risk increase of 25% would move your total risk from 4% to 5%. So it is not like you're just shooting up this absolute risk amount by that much. It's the difference of less than a percent. I don't want to completely dismiss epidemiology. What we really need are more long-term randomized control trials and we need more epidemiology as well because this study kind of stands alone right now. There are a few other studies that suggest that artificial sweeteners may be associated with greater rates of cancer, but then there's some other studies that show that they aren't. So really, when we have this kind of opposing view in studies, we just need more and we need more randomized control trials. Let's make the devil's advocate argument that artificial sweeteners do increase the risk of cancer, specifically, aspartame and acesulfame K in this study since sucralose was not associated with increased risk of cancer. Even if that was the case, the hazard ratios for regular sugar and for obesity are far greater than the hazard ratios for artificial sweeteners. It's all about what you're replacing things with. So if you're replacing sugary drink intake with artificial sweeteners, even if they did increase the risk of cancer, which again, I'm not saying they do, I'm definitely not convinced that they do. If you drank artificial sweeteners or ate artificial sweeteners, it's still likely better than drinking or eating the fully loaded sugary stuff. And if artificial sweeteners enable you to lose weight and keep it off, and there is a study showing that artificial sweeteners 
enabled people to lose more weight and they did better at keeping it off than the group that did not consume artificial sweeteners, then that's still a net positive, even if it's not the most perfect thing you can do. And I think one of the things we really need to keep in mind is that this idea that there's a, a perfect diet and you can just have everybody do this, it's not reasonable for most people's lives. So we have to keep in mind the unintended consequences of some of this messaging. Somebody who's overweight or obese, who is actually having success with reducing their sugary beverage intake by consuming artificial sweeteners, might read this study or the headlines around it and say, oh my gosh, I shouldn't consume diet soda. And so they start going back to drinking sugar sweetened beverages, don't lose the weight, and now they're actually at greater risk for cancer based on being overweight or obese than they would have been just drinking the diet soda. Based on this research, I am not ready to say artificial sweeteners cause cancer. Based on the current body of evidence, I don't think they cause cancer because even in the rodent studies, to get them to show carcinogenic effects, they have to feed huge amounts of artificial sweeteners that you would never be able to get in a physiological dose in humans. If you don't wanna take in artificial sweeteners, if you're able to stick to a healthy diet just fine and not have artificial sweeteners, hey, good on you. But if you're somebody who struggled with losing weight and you find the artificial sweeteners help you, this is not a reason to stop consuming them. They're probably still a relatively good benefit for you. All right, guys, if you liked the video, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I'm sure the zealots from the church of anti-artificial anything are on their way up the stairs right now to smack me in the face.